All right, guys, welcome to 2.3, Graphs That Enlighten and Graphs That Deceive. What we're going to figure out is how can the way a graph is displayed possibly be misleading. So we're going to look at good graphs and, well, bad graphs. So we already saw some histograms. We looked at the shape of the distribution of the data. Now we're gonna look at all kinds of other graphs and they're gonna see how they can be enlightening, help us see the data better, and how they can actually give us the wrong impression or be misleading. The first one we're gonna look at is a dot plot. A dot plot is a graph that has your quantitative data in which each data value is plotted as a point, basically a dot. And these dots are going to be stacked upon each other. So what does this do? It displays the shape of the distribution of the data. And it does it really well. And one of the things that's also a unique thing about it is that you can recreate the original list of data values from the dots. So let's look at some dot plots. All right, the dot plot. See these little dots in here? Each one of those corresponds to the numbers in the table they had um, that they didn't tell us, that they didn't list here. So what this kind of means is that there's somebody with a 40 pulse and probably someone with a 42 pulse in the list. A couple of people here with a 50 pulse. A bunch of people it looks like here with maybe a 66 pulse. Look at all these people here in this dots of line here. So each time you see a number in the list, you put a dot above on the horizontal axis down here where that is. So let's practice it. All right, I have a list of numbers right here. And I'm gonna put a dot so notice down here at the bottom, I go from 35 to 95 on my little scale. I'm going to put a dot for each one of these. So at 80, there's a dot. Okay. 94, it's going to be right here before 95. 58, it's going to be right here before 60. 66. 56. 82. 78, 86, 88, 56, I already have a 56, so I'm going to put a dot above him, 36, 66, oh, I already have him, so I'm going to put a dot above him, 84, 76, 78, and I already have a dot up here at 78, so I'm going to put another one above him. 64, 66 again, so another dot at 66, 78 again, so I'm going to go back to 78. I'm going to put a third dot, and then we've got 60 and 64. And I already had one at 64, so that's my second dot. So all those dots are my dot plot. And what I can tell on this is, one, that 36 here is an outlier, because he's way over here away from all the data. I can tell that I had three 66s and I had three of these 78s. I can see I had one or two of all the others and kind of be able to recreate my list from this. I can see who the most and who the least were and a general shape of my data. So that's a dot plot. Stem and leaf plots. 
stem plot, stem and leaf plots. Basically, it's a straight line, vertical line is drawn. On the left side of the line is the leftmost dif digit of your number. That's your stem. The right side's the rightmost digit of your number. That's the leaf. So that's what we're talking about here. And we're gonna get to see these, but the stem and leaf plot, it's got a few major features when it shows the shape of the distribution of the data. That's important, we need that shape. And it retains all of the original data values. So you can recreate your list if you ever need to. And it's also pretty cool because the sample data is sorted. It's arranged in order. And you can expand the graph to include more rows or condense it with fewer rows. It's kind of versatile, the stem and leaf plot. So let's go look at stem and leaf plots. All right, so I have this vertical line right here. And on the left side is like the tens digit. And on the right side are like the ones digits of every number. So over here, it says the pulse rates of 40 and 42. Here's the 40. Four zero, and then 40 plus two makes 42. This is the 90s, so it has 90, 92, 94, 96, and 96. So that's stem and leaf. Well, you can't get away without practicing making one, so that's what we're gonna do to get the really good handle of stem and leaf plots. So I have a list of numbers. And over here, I've already drawn my vertical line. And I'm going to start on the left side. And I'm just gonna start, looks like the smallest number in my list is 36. So I'm gonna put a three for 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And I don't think I have anything bigger than 90s, so I'm good. Yeah. I'm going to split these numbers. I have 80. So under the eight, I'm gonna put a zero. Um, let's see, I'm gonna make this kind of organized. I'm gonna look at all my 30s first. I have a 36, and that's the only one, so 36. Now I'm gonna look at my 40s in the list. I don't have any 40s. So now I'm gonna move on to my 50s in the list. I have a 58 and a 56. And that looks like the only up to 56s and a 58. So 56, 56, and 58. Now I'm gonna look for my 60s. I have a 66. and another 66, and a 64, a 60, and a 64. So I have a 60, two 64s, and one, two, three 66s. Now I'm gonna look at my 70s. I have a 78, 76 and a 78 and another 78. So I have a 76 and one, two, three 78s. I already took care of the 80. I have an 82, 86, 88, and 84. So I took care of the 80. I have an 82. I have an 84 and an 86 and an 88. Now my 90s, just a 94. And there's my stem and leaf plot. 
Now, one of the things that you will notice is over on the left-hand side. It took me a little bit, but I ordered these. From least to greatest. So, like 56 came before 58. 60 became before 64 and 66. So, these are in order from least to greatest. And if you turn your little um, graph to the side, which I'm not going to do, this is kind of like your histogram bars. So if you turn them to the side, you can kind of see your little histogram bars going on in there. This one only has one high, this one's three high, one, two, three, four, this one's six high, this one's four high. This one's five high, and that one's one high. So it kind of makes like your histogram bars. Really cool way to see the shape and the order of the data. Let's look at our next graph. This one is a time series graph, and it basically tells over time your points, what it's doing. So it tells us our trends. over time. So let's look at a time series graph. All right, so this is apparently a graph uh, from various years down here, 1985 to a little past 2010. And it talks about law enforcement fatalities. And that's like every year, how many law enforcement fatalities are there? For instance, in the 90s, early 90s, it looks like we had per year about 140 something deaths for law enforcement officers. And if you kind of look at this graph, it starts out here in 85, kind of high, goes up and then shoots down in the early 90s. And then it kind of climbs again and then goes down. And it's up and down, up and down. Now it has a spike right here. Let's see when that year was. I don't know about you, but that looks like 2001. Now I know you guys are young, but in 2001, that is when 9-11 happened. So yeah, we had a lot of deaths that year for police officers. But then it came down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And look here, in about 2015, it wasn't too bad. It was lower. So I'm going to erase all that stuff I have on there. And we're going to look at the trend over time. I'm going to look at overall, what is my graph doing? Overall, it's going down over time. So the trend is downward. That's what a time series graph tells us. Is something kind of moving up, down, staying about the same? That's what they do, and it's per time. All right. Let's look at some more graphs. Bar graphs and Pareto charts. Bar graphs, you've seen them a lot. They have equal widths and they show the frequencies of your categories. And your bars may or may not be separated by gaps. In a histogram, they have no gaps. But in a bar graph, they might actually have some gaps. What do they do? They show your relative distribution of your data. So you can compare different categories. Now, a Pareto chart, that's a really cool bar graph. And what it does is the bars are arranged in descending order.
because it's dealing with categorical data, you're going to arrange them in descending order from the highest frequencies to the lowest. So the bars are going to decrease in height. And what does it do? It also shows that relative distribution so you can see the different categories. But it draws attention to the more important categories, the higher bars. So let's see a Pareto chart. He's a bar graph because he's got bars. Notice down here on the bottom, it's all these uh, different types of boats. Those are categorical data. Jet skis, motor boats, utility or fishing boats, inward, inboard boats, uh, sailboats. And you notice that it goes down in its heights of our bars. This is a Pareto graph. Highest to lowest. Ah, let's see another graph you're probably familiar with. The circle graph or pie chart. And what does it do? It shows the uh, each slice that is proportional to the frequency counts. So each slice is going to be proportional to the frequency counts. for each category. Now they're common, but they're not real effective, but Pareto charts are more effective, just gonna say, because you can see who's the highest bar all the way down to the lowest bar. Pie charts you may have to really look at to tell the biggest category, because you're looking at slices of the pie. But it still shows the distribution of your data. There's a beautiful pie chart, and he's the same one as we had as the Pareto chart. Our biggest bar was the jet ski. That's the biggest slice of the pie. And then came next the motor boat. He's the next biggest slice. Then the utility in board. And our small guy was the sailboat. Apparently we don't steal sailboats very often. We steal a lot of jet skis. So one of the things that we do is we look at, say up here, the jet skis. Those are 46% of your total uh, frequencies. So you take 46% as a decimal times, there's 360 degrees in a circle. And that's gonna tell you that that is gonna be 166 degrees for this central angle here this is 66 degrees, 166 degrees, sorry. So what you do is you take the percentage that it is out of all of them for the frequencies, and then you multiply that decimal by 360 degrees in a circle and it tells you how big of an arc to draw. So that means you're gonna have to get your little protractor out to draw those. All right, now this one you probably haven't seen very often. He's got a frequency polygon. And he looks a lot like a histogram as far as uh, how he's constructed, except he uses line segments instead of bars. So this is a frequency polygon. These are the line segments there in red, and those little dots in the middle, those uh, heights correspond to your frequencies. And over in the very center down here, these numbers, these are your midpoints of your classes. So you look at your midpoint and put your dot and then you connect the dots with line segments. This one's a frequency polygon. Now a relative frequency polygon, it still uses 
uh, frequencies, but they're relative frequencies, and they're going to be in proportion uh, <coughs> or even in percentage form on the vertical scale. But you can actually see two or more relative fre frequency polygons on the same graph, so you can compare them. So like the last one was about McDonald's times. Well, if I want to do McDonald's and say Dunkin' Donuts, I could do those together, which is what this one does. Now, I know it's been a little while since you saw the video where we compared McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts in a table, but we had said that McDonald's, he takes a little longer to cook your food because he's making burgers than Dunkin' Donuts over here. He takes less time because all he's doing is pulling some donuts out to serve you. So we can see that you know, based on which restaurant it is, we can see why Dunkin' Donuts has faster response times than, say, McDonald's. And we can see that compared on one graph through a relative frequency polygon. All right, now those are all good graphs. They show the data well. You can compare the data well, but sometimes you use graphs in, inappropriately and it can deceive people. And honestly, that's what we see most of the time, whether you see it on the news um, or in other types of media, advertising, you see the wrong types or deceptive graphs. So what do we mean by that? Well, one way to be deceptive is using a non-zero axis. This means you don't start at zero. It makes your data that you plotted perfectly legal appear exaggerated. Another thing, and these are terrible to use, but everybody does them, is pictographs. It's really you're using a two or three dimensional object to show data. And what it does is it also inflates or makes your impression that things are greater than they should be. So we're going to look at both of these ways of deceiving people. All right. So this one here talks about uh, OxyContin. And it's a drug. And um, they were sitting here talking about they had a couple of groups here and they wanted to talk about the differences between them, okay? And one of the things they say um, is that a nausea rate um, is truly, so the true ratio is about two to one for nausea, okay? So that means that nausea is really not that big of a problem. So out of three people, Two people do not get nausea, one does, I believe. I might be wrong on that, I might be backwards. No, it's two people get nausea for every three people. So about two thirds, but that's still not terrible. So let's see what this looks like. All right, the graph here on the left. This one, if you look at the Oxycontin here, these are the people that get nausea. That's about 23% of the people, right? <coughs> and all right, now over here is our people that are taking the placebo in the experiment. And that looks like about 11% of the people. Seems about right. So on this one, we're seeing the difference between them, between 23 and 11. Well, 11 times two is 22, so that should be about double. Well, if I double this little placebo guy, that's about that high. That does not look like it goes the right height. So I'm gonna put some of those in there, those little green ones. There's a little green one. 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 This is definitely not two little green ones for one big red one. 
which is what the data says. It's a lot more. It's probably about 12 times as high, to be honest with you. Now, I'm going to go over to the graph that is actually not deceptive. That's this guy. He, again, shows us to be somewhere around 23%. And this little guy over here shows us to be somewhere around 11%. So I'm going to take my 11 and I'm going to pop him over in here. And I'm going to pop another one of them over in here. So that does look about double. So this one on the left is deception. And the one on the right is a good one. Now, how would I have known without having to draw a bunch of little placebos inside of an Oxycontin one? Well, look down here at the scale. It goes from zero and it's nice and even all the way up. Down here, it starts at 10. It's even all the way up like it should be, nicely spaced, but it started at 10, not zero. That's what makes him deceptive. He dropped off a whole bunch of the part that they're the same height at to make it look like Oxycontin is gonna be making you way more nauseous than it should. It makes you a little bit, but not much more. Deception. Now here's another idea of deception. This one's about pictographs. And as you can see, it's a picture that's supposed to represent our graph. Now, if you kind of read through our little word problem here, it tells us um, the percentages, the actual percentages, say 37% was the smoking rate in 1970. And 18% was the smoking rate in 2013. Now, you have to kind of look at this guy. And this guy here, he's about that long. So I'm going to put that guy in here. Okay, I'd say that's a good, I don't know, twice as long at least. And then if you look to see how wide this guy is, that's about twice as deep. So now just knowing a little bit from uh, back when you were in geometry, you know volume. Volume is three dimensional. So if this is twice as long, twice as wide, twice as deep, that's going to be eight times bigger over here. But if you look at your numbers, 18 to 37 is only two times bigger. So this is why it's deceptive, is because you could fit eight of the little cigarettes into the big cigarette, when really you should only be able to fit two little cigarettes in the big one. So it shows that, hey, we went from 37 to 18%. We basically divided by two our smokers and, but the picture shows that we actually divided it by eight, and we really didn't. That's a lie. Pictographs tend to be lying because they use three-dimensional shapes to convey to us one-dimensional data. All right, so some ideas on this. In general, if you have small data sets, like 20 values or less, don't even do a graph, just use a table. If a graph is gonna make you focus on the true nature of the data, that's good. However, don't use a bunch of eye-catching pictures. Don't waste ink on the design elements. Do not distort data. Use the graph that reveals the true nature of it. And any ink that you put on there should be for the data, not for design elements. So um, if you're doing all this ink, it shouldn't be to make pictures of cigarettes. It should be making bar graphs like histograms or Pareto charts or 
It should be looking at time series graphs. That's what you should spend your time on. You want to make sure you have a zero start on your axis and everything's 